All right, this supplemental video is to go over our last topic out of chapter three, and that is of periodic trends. Now, periodic trends are pretty easy to follow if you can kind of grasp some small fundamental issues. So let's get into it. So up until this point, we've done a lot of work with looking at the periodic table and helping the period, using the periodic table to help a lot of us find a lot of different things. Things like um, metallic versus non-metallic character, reactivity trends, um, electron configurations, quantum numbers, those kinds of things. Well, we're also going to be able to do some other things in terms of physical properties. And so we're gonna focus on four trends in particular. And of those four, three of them are particularly important to the majority of the discussions that we're gonna make in the coming chapters. So the trends that we're gonna look at, atomic size, ionic size, ionization energy. And then we're just gonna to touch on one little concept of something known as electron affinity. Um, we're not gonna talk a whole lot about it because of the four that we're discussing, it's the trend that has the least trend to it, the least generalization, and is kind of the least useful as a result. So let's get into it. One of the best ways to understand periodic trends in general is by understanding a phenomenon known as effective nuclear charge. Now, effective nuclear charge is a fancy way of saying, if I'm looking at the electrons on the far side of the atom, the ones that are the furthest away from that nucleus, how much of the nucleus, how much of that positive charge inside of that nucleus do they actually feel? And this is important because we know that inside of the atom, there's this yin and yang going on, where we've got attractive forces between the positive nucleus and the negative electrons, but we also have negative interactions between the electrons and each other. The electrons repel each other. And so they wanna be as far apart from each other as possible, but at the same time, they're both drawn in by that nucleus. And so this interplay between the attractive and the repulsive forces ultimately help us to decide just how tightly those electrons are held. And that helps us to figure out some other ideas along the way. Now we can generally estimate effective nuclear charge, which is given to us by ZEFF. So if you remember from our AZX notation, Z is the atomic number of the element, ZEFF would be the effective charge of that nucleus. And that's taken by, found by taking the atomic number Z and subtracting from it S, a screening constant, sometimes referred to as a shielding constant. And this screening constant is usually pretty close to the number of inner electrons. So if I take the number of core electrons, the if I'm looking at the noble gas configuration, the number of electrons designated by that noble gas, by any d orbitals um, outside of that noble gas configuration, I get a pretty close approximation of the screening constant, and therefore a pretty close approximation of the effective nuclear charge. And so to that end, if I'm looking at a sodium nucleus, for example, Sodium nucleus has 11 protons in it, so its, effect, so it's uh, atomic number is 11. And if I look at the number of core electrons it has, there are 10. 10 core electrons that are very tightly held by that nucleus, which means that those 10 electrons kind of more or less cancel out 10 of the protons in that nucleus, which means that the electron here on the outside really only feels about one of the protons in that nucleus. And therefore, this electron is not nearly as impacted by the nucleus as some other electrons in the same energy level. And so this electron is gonna be a little bit easier to remove as a result. So these are the kinds of things that we are going to have to take into consideration as we look at some of these trends overall. 
So the first trend that we're gonna look at is something called atomic size. Now atomic size has two general trends. There is a trend as we look at going up and down the periodic table. And there is a trend as we go from left to right on the periodic table. The trend as we go up and down is that of an increasing size. So as we go from the top of the table to the bottom of the table, we have an increase in size. And the primary reason for that is we have more energy levels that are capable of doing greater amounts of shielding than what we had before. And as we go from left to right, we see that we have a general decrease in size. And this comes from greater effective nuclear charge due to more protons that are unshielded. In the energy level. So if we go back to that, that kind of thought that we saw in the previous slide, we had 11 protons in sodium and 10 core electrons in sodium for an effective nuclear charge of just positive one. So again, this was for sodium. If I go just one door down to magnesium, you'll see that I have 12 protons, the same 10 core electrons because the energy level, the extra electron is going to the outside, not onto the inside. So the effective nuclear charge there is positive two. So even though there are more electrons in that outer level that are capable of repelling each other, there are more protons that are capable of attracting those electrons. And ultimately the level of attraction for those protons is going to be greater than the level of repulsion for those electrons. Net result, we see more shielding here we see more attraction here, and that greater level of attraction pulls in those electrons more, makes the atom smaller overall. We can see this in a relatively clear picture here. This is your periodic trend. Notice that this trend is excluding the transition metals, excluding the inner transition metals, because the trends there do not apply and actually are not very consistent at all. But we can see, generally speaking, as we go down a column, we do see increases in size overall. As we go across a row, we can see general changes of decrease as we go across. Not to say that there aren't exceptions. Um, it does get a little bit goofy here in the middle, especially as we go into those lower energy levels. But overall, the general trend is a downward one as we go from left to right. For ionic size, there are two trends that we are going to consider. First one that we need to consider is cation and anion trend. And that is cations tend to be smaller than their parent atoms. And if we dive into the answer why there, I think it'll make some sense to you. Let's again focus on sodium. Sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. If we go to sodium plus, we now have 11 protons and 10 electrons.
And so what we see there is two things. We're losing repulsion. A loss of repulsion because of the fewer number of electrons means we're gonna get more attraction. Those remaining electrons are gonna be pulled in tighter by the protons because there's less um, repulsion to drive them apart. And the other thing that happens, especially for cations, is we tend to lose energy levels. So remember the configuration for sodium was neon 3s1. If I take away that 3s1, all that's left is neon, which we can rewrite as helium 2s2 2p6. Either way you look at it, we've lost this third energy level. It's gone. And so that alone is gonna shrink the size of, of the atom by, by losing that extra energy level. Now for anions, it's not as clear to see usually. We're not talking about full loss of an energy level. What we are talking about is a gain of repulsion. So if I look at something like fluorine, fluorine has nine protons, and nine electrons. Fluoride ion has nine protons and 10 electrons. So the extra electrons here are going to create a greater level of, of repulsion that is going to cause the ion to expand slightly larger in size. Um, and that's really about the only explanation that we can give for it. We're not gonna see increases in energy level. We're not gonna see anything that is kind of super obvious like that. The difference here is gonna be a lot more subtle because the extra repulsion is going to increase shielding and lower that effective nuclear charge essentially. And so if we look at our trends in size, we can see the effect of both. First of all, we can see that when we go from a positive ion, or excuse me, from an atom to a positive ion, we do tend to see a drop in size. When we go from an atom to a negative ion, we do see an increase in size. But what I want you to look at also is look at the general trend among the cations and the anions. Look, as we go from lithium to sodium to potassium, the trend for the ions is the same as the trend for the parent atoms. As you go down the group, things still get larger because of that extra energy level. And if you go from left to right, we can see that the increased attraction of that more powerful nucleus is going to be more profound as we go from left to right. We're gonna get smaller and smaller. And this is also true within the anions as well. Adding energy levels continues to make my negative ions larger. Adding protons to the nucleus makes my atoms smaller but the difference here is not nearly as profound because of those extra electrons, the extra repulsion formed from the, the, the ions being, you know, having extra electrons. The second trend that we can look at is that of something called an isoelectronic series. Now for an isoelectronic series, what we are talking about is a series of atoms and ions that all have the same number of electrons. And the trend there is really simple. The trend is directly related to the number of protons. The more protons that the nucleus has, the smaller the species in that isoelectronic species is going to be. And so just as a method of comparison, let's look at sodium ion, magnesium ion, neon, oxide ion, and fluoride ion. 
all five of these species have 10 electrons. The difference, magnesium has Magnesium has 12 protons, sodium has 11 protons, neon has 10 protons, fluorine, fluoride has nine, oxide has eight. The more protons that you have, the more attractive forces exist, and the more that those electrons are gonna be pulled in closer to that nucleus and make the whole thing smaller. So let's do a practice problem just to kind of uh, familiarize ourselves with some of these trends. Using the periodic table, we want to arrange each set by size, going from largest to smallest. So for this one, I'm going to need a periodic table. It just so happens that I have one right here. This is just a periodic table out of your textbook. And so if I look, I'm comparing oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Now oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur exist in a little corner of the periodic table that looks kind of like this. Oxygen here, sulfur here, phosphorus here. So just on energy level alone, I know that oxygen is going to be the smallest. Oxygen has a smaller has fewer energy levels than phosphorus and sulfur. That alone is probably enough to make it the smallest. So oxygen's going to be the smallest. Of phosphorus and sulfur, which one is going to be bigger? Well, it's going to be the phosphorus because the phosphorus has fewer protons pulling on it than the sulfur does. And so the sulfur's electrons are going to be pulled in a little bit more tightly. My correct order would be phosphorus, then sulfur, then oxygen. If I'm comparing sodium ions, sodium and potassium, sodium and potassium are right on top of each other on the periodic table. Sodium is here, potassium is here. So of these two, I know that the potassium is going to be the largest. Between sodium and sodium ion, I know that sodium is going to be bigger than the sodium ion. Why do I know that? Well, our trend says that cations are smaller. And the reason why cations are smaller is because in this case, the sodium actually has one fewer energy level than the, the sodium ion has one fewer energy level than the sodium uh, atom does. Here I have hydride, helium, lithium ion, and beryllium ion. This is an isoelectronic series, so I need to know the number of protons of each. Hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, lithium has three, beryllium has four. So they're gonna go in, well, reverse order. Hydride ion is gonna be the biggest because it has the, fewer, the fewest protons pulling on it. Helium atom would be next followed by lithium atom, or excuse me, lithium ion, and beryllium ion. Finally, sodium ion, potassium ion, and cesium ion. Well, this one, I have to know my periodic table pretty well. So I've got sodium, potassium, rubidium, 
and cesium all in a vertical row. If I'm dealing with ions of the same charge from the same group, then the group trend for elements applies to the ions as well. The cesium ion would be the largest, followed by the potassium ion, followed by the sodium ion. The last major trend that we're going to look at is ionization energy. Now, by definition, ionization energy is the energy that's required to remove an a mole of electrons from one mole of gas phase atoms or ions. Now, removing electrons does require energy, so all the values here are going to be positive. The thing about ionization energy is that, generally speaking, it is inversely related to atomic or ionic size. That is, the bigger something is, the easier it is to remove electrons from it. And therefore, the lower the ionization energy will be. And the smaller something is, the more energy it's going to take to rip an electron out of it. Now, that's a general trend. There are a couple of exceptions and anomalies associated with that trend, and those are largely configuration-based. So the two anomaly sets are as follows. In between groups 2 and 13, so in between the alkaline earth metals and the boron group, we would expect, based on our periodic trend, that the boron group would have a higher ionization energy than the alkaline earth metals would. We find, however, in practice that, that this is not the case. And our best explanation for it is based on configuration. We rationalize that the configuration of group two, which would have an S sublevel that is full and a P sublevel that is empty, we would rationalize that this is actually a relatively stable configuration compared to we have an S sublevel that is full and a P sublevel that is partially full. Removing this electron from the P would actually get us back to this state here where we have complete symmetry and, and stability so this one actually wants to happen, whereas this one is less likely to happen. And so as a result, we see a switching between those two groups. <coughs> we can see a similar argument between groups 15 and 16. In group 15, we have a similar kind of situation to group two. Only difference is that instead of a completely unfilled P sublevel, we have a half filled P sublevel. And in group 16, we have an unbalanced sublevel where the S sublevel is completely full, but the P sublevel has an extra electron in one of those spots. And so we rationalize that this configuration has an extra little bit of stability to it because of the evenness of the spread of electrons, whereas this one is a little bit out of sorts because of that extra electron in that first orbital. And so this one is much more willing to give up that electron than this, than this configuration is to give up that first electron and become unbalanced. So those are the two primary exceptions that exist. Now, as we look at this table, we will see that those exceptions are not terribly consistent. <coughs> so we can see in general, okay, period two, period three, period four. It works pretty well there. By the time we get to period five, um, 
the energy levels are just so close in energy to each other, the, the electrons really can't tell a difference. The trend becomes a lot more normal, a lot more like we would expect for atomic size once we get down to periods five and six. Same deal for the group 15 and 16. We can see that nitrogen to oxygen, phosphorus to sulfur, calcium to selenium. The trend holds up pretty well as far as the anomaly is concerned. But once we get to period five again, we're seeing things back to normal for the most part. So these exceptions really only apply for the first four periods. Once we get to period five, um, the fifth energy level, again, we see things kind of shorten up a little bit and the trends become a lot more uh, familiar, a lot more generic than they were in the previous four periods. Another trend that we can look at is something called a successive trend. If I am looking at the ionization energy for multiple ionization energies, so removing the first electron, then removing a second, then removing a third, then removing a fourth, the subscripts here refer to how many electrons have been removed at that point. And what we notice is that when we hit a spot where we have vacated an energy level, we tend to see a dramatic jump in energy between one ionization and the next ionization. So after we remove the first electron in lithium, which was in the 2s sublevel, and we go to now into the 1s sublevel, we see a big spike. Once we remove two electrons for beryllium and we're now into the core electrons for beryllium, we see a big spike. And this spiking happens, and this is a very predictable trend, all the way through the periodic table. As soon as we evacuate an energy level, the next electron is way harder to remove than the one before it. In general, we do see that as we go from one electron loss to the next, we do see a general upward trend in energy, and that should make sense as well. We've lost repulsion, which means we've gained attraction, and so each one of those electrons that gets removed, the remaining electrons are held a little bit more tightly by the nucleus because there's now less repulsion and less shielding of those outer electrons from that nucleus. And so the last trend that we're going to look at is electron affinity. Again, we're not going to focus a whole lot on it because the trend here is very, very, very unpredictable. There, there's not a whole lot of gener generalities to it. The only thing that we can really say about it, um, let's define it first. Electron affinity is kind of the opposite of ionization energy. Ionization energy, how much energy do you have to put into an atom to get it to release an electron? Electron affinity, how much energy is released when an electron is added to an energy level. And so because the value, because energy tends to be released in these cases, most electron affinity values are in fact negative. Now some general trends, we tend to see that electron affinity does become more negative as we go across the row. And that makes some sense to us. As we go from left to right, we go from elements that really want to ditch their electrons, metals, to elements that would prefer to gain electrons, nonmetals. And the closer an element is to filling that outer energy level, the more affinity it's going to have for that electron. So the most negative value is going to be the, no, um, excuse me, the halogens. The halogens have seven valence electrons, adding one more fills their energy, their valence shell, fills that outer energy level, and they gain a ton of stability for it. So halogens in general are very hungry for electrons and are going to release a ton of energy when they get one. 
And generally speaking, the chalcogens in the oxygen group tend to want electrons a little bit more than the nitrogen group and certainly more than the carbon group. There are some exceptions here. Don't get bogged down in the exceptions. We're not going to talk a whole lot about electron affinity beyond this discussion right here. But we can see in general, there is a slight trend here. Halogens by far the most wanting of electrons. We can see that there are some um, that do want electrons, you know, so the chalcogens here in the oxygen group do want electrons, much more so than the nitrogen group or the carbon group. Um, there are some ones that are surprising in here. Uh, you wouldn't think of the alkali metals as actually wanting electrons, but um, they, will they will release energy when they grab an, an electron because it does fill that S sublevel for them. Um, the alkaline earth metals are actually much less likely to do that because their S sublevel is already filled, and so that extra electron would actually go to a new sublevel, um, which tends to come with a drop of stability. The other thing that is worth noting here is if you look at the noble gases, Notice that all the noble gases have virtually no affinity for electrons, and that's because they're already stable as is. They don't need anything more. So that concludes our look at periodic trends. Um, uh, I hope you learned something from this video, and uh, if you have any questions, be sure to uh, drop them in the comments or bring them with you to our next review session. Uh, have a good day.